Hello, I'm Fred Freeze, the proprietor of FredFreezeUnleashed.com. This summer, I was asked to review a book entitled The Universal Cycle Theory, specifically because of my interest in cosmology and because of my limited formal scientific schooling. After initial reluctance, the authors finally persuaded me to read this revolutionary work. And boy, am I glad I did! It's not every day that a new theory of the universe comes along that finally makes sense. During the next few minutes, listen why this new theory captivated me to the extent that it has, and why it will surely captivate you as well. One of the things that struck me about the universal cycle theory was the great care and detail provided by the authors. Overall, the book reads like an essay, albeit a very long essay at 600 plus pages. It never talks down to the reader, while at the same time it delivers new concepts in a logical, thoughtful, and straightforward manner. It is convincing and thorough, as it covers topics including astronomy, physics, chemistry, geology, biology, and other sciences. The book is the end result of a two-year collaborative effort by its co-authors. Steve Pitts performed the mathematical, statistical, and theoretical development. Glenn Borkert gave philosophical and editorial guidance, <laughs> always keeping Steve on course when he occasionally strayed into contradictory territories. I really like the universal cycle theory because it explains difficult concepts in easy to understand ways. It explains cycles in terms of vortices and waves. A vortex is a rotating cycle because motion occurs in circles, one revolution after another, as shown in the left image of Hurricane Isabel in 2003. Compression waves are linear cycles because motion occurs in lines moving away from a source, as shown in the right image of water waves. The book repeatedly uses these familiar cycles to explain numerous motions in the universe. The book is based on the concept of infinity, first defined by Glenn Borkert in 2004. It assumes that there are no smallest elementary particles. It also assumes there is no largest structure in the universe. While this concept took some time for me to get used to, after thinking about it, it made a great deal of sense because it matches the structure that scientists are currently able to observe. The book also states that infinity means that the universe had no beginning and that it will have no end. I also like the universal cycle theory because it goes to great lengths to explain the ten assumptions of science. The theory is based on these sensible assumptions. Throughout the book, the authors solve many problems by relying on these basic assumptions. Their explanations of the solutions provide thoughtful, logical, and interesting reading. At least the text made me stop and think continually, and I really believe it will do the same for you. The book also uses sensible theoretical guidelines. Scientific philosopher Thomas Kuhn, author of the widely acclaimed book The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, also wrote Objectivity, Value Judgment, and Theory Choice. It gives the accepted guidelines for developing a scientific theory, which the authors fully embrace. Based on these criteria, I was impressed how their model describes nature in ways that make sense. To keep their theory self-consistent, the authors often reject parts of existing theories. They outstandingly do so with the simplicity recommended by Kuhn. Chapter 4 makes a strong case for seeking alternatives to existing theories based on the known contradictions among quantum mechanics, general relativity, and gravity. Readers need to know the shortcomings and contradictions of the current theories. This is a great chapter. The authors never hesitated to seek alternative interpretations when the accepted theories are loaded with contradictions. The universal cycle theory is based on the idea that the universe operates as an infinite hierarchy of matter and motion. The overall concept was very pleasing because, observationally, that is exactly what we see. The chapter explaining the infinite hierarchy was challenging for me because it often described structures and motions in terms of density. However, all the information given in this chapter is essential, and technically inclined readers will appreciate it. 
One piece of evidence that really surprised me was how volcanic activity is synchronized among the inner solar system planets. The authors point out that this indicates a common cause. Of course, this challenges existing theories, which rely almost exclusively on internal mechanics for explaining volcanism. The graph here shows the correlations among an 822 million year cycle and volcanic activity on the Earth, Mars, and the Moon. The authors do an amazing job of explaining how inner solar system volcanic activity can be synchronized and episodic. The book also gives extensive evidence of cycles in geomagnetic intensity and geomagnetic reversals, which are linked in predictable patterns. This graph shows an example of an 83.5 thousand year cycle in geomagnetic intensity. Their explanation of geomagnetism is unique, quite interesting, and very credible. This graph gives another example related to geomagnetism. It shows a 182.6 million year cycle in supercrons, which are periods without geomagnetic reversals, marked in red. It also shows a 182.6 million year cycle in periods with frequent geomagnetic reversals, marked in green. These graphics and this type of evidence made the book educational for me and a pleasure to read. Chapter 6 discusses the cause of cycles. And while the concepts discussed here were occasionally complex for me, I appreciated the attempts to make the reading clear for the non-scientist. For example, the graph here and the explanations in the book were used to explain compression waves, the kind of waves that move through water. In later chapters, the authors then show how compressions and decompressions cause waves at different scales of the universe. For example, they show how compression waves contribute to the arms in spiral galaxies. Their use of analogies made some fairly complex topics understandable for me. Chapter 7 gave a great presentation of what seems to be standard astronomical fare, but with the neomechanical bent hypothesized by the authors. This makes following chapters more accessible to would-be skeptics of the universal cycle theory. It was interesting how the authors took standard classification systems, such as the Hubble classification system of galaxies, shown here, and explained how all forms of matter behave in similar ways at all levels of the infinite hierarchy. Among other things, Chapter 8 shows the importance of light emitted from objects. For instance, the graph shows the spectrum of light emitted from six different atoms. The luminosity and spectral bands of emitted light give very useful information about the properties of atoms, planets, stars, galaxies, and other objects. The book really explains the implications of these properties of light. In some cases, they go beyond conventional explanations. Readers may possibly wane at the length of the detail, but they should still appreciate the thoroughness of the research. I know I did. Until reading Chapter 9, I never realized how much shapes and motions reveal the properties of matter. The authors show how properties such as mass, rotations, orbits, axial flows, color, luminosity, location, age, expected life, and density are all related. Once a few properties are known, good guesses are possible about the other related properties. In this image of the galaxy Centaurus A, the authors show how the flat plane of stars and the axial flow are two signs of a rapidly rotating object. This image shows a supernova just moments after it exploded. It also indicates the importance of shapes. I always imagined that supernova exploded spherically. However, the authors, in their continual attention to detail, point out that all images of supernovae show explosions of two halves separating, as seen in this image from NASA. The authors explain shapes, such as the two halves of a supernova, in a highly satisfactory way. Chapter 9 shows this graph of the bulk density of atoms, ordered by atomic numbers. Bulk density reaches a minimum at each of the noble gases, which are marked by the vertical grid lines. 
readers will never imagine the extent that cycles play in universal structure until they read this book. Kudos to the authors for demonstrating the weakness in the absolutist view of physical constants in Chapter 10. Though somewhat complex, all readers should appreciate the view of variable constants presented in this chapter. The graph here shows how the speed of sound varies inside the sun, which is typical of all so-called constants. Different times and different locations determine the current values of all physical constants. One of the big surprises in the book came in Chapter 16. It showed mass extinction cycles of 60.9 million years and 182.7 million years. The authors show how these cycles are closely linked with cycles in geomagnetism and volcanic activity. That concludes Part 1 of my review. The introductory chapters of the Universal Cycle Theory captivated me and made me think about aspects of the universe that I had never considered before. As great as the first part was, the second half of the book was even more intriguing because it explained the cause of gravitation and it gave a credible alternative to the Big Bang Theory. But that comes in the next video. For now, this is Fred Fries, hoping you enjoyed this introduction to the Universal Cycle Theory and inviting you to listen to the second half of the review.